Welcome, 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 everybody. Um, live stream. Just figure out the lighting. That's intense lighting here. <laughs> uh, let me know when you come in if you can hear me. Um, how the sound is. Uh, always let me know that. I hope everybody's doing good. Um, staying safe, staying well, uh, staying connected out there. Um, gonna just kind of let people ease in here for the first minute. Um, I see 12 of you. Uh, somebody just, uh, I always ask in the beginning, somebody just tell me uh, in the chat. Yeah, good. I'm assuming Ghost Dog that that means you can hear me well. Um, always just want to make sure you can hear me well um, before I go into the riff. Um, let me just do the usual opening, which is awesome. Thank you guys. So glad. If you're watching this, hit the like button. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Later on, um, I will be taking super chat questions, and if they're good, I'll do my best to give you good response. Um, and the whole way that this operation happens and sustains everything we're doing, uh, including a book we're working on, uh, and the illicit history docs and all the shows is by going to patreon.com slash TMBS, becoming a patron. We still gotta get to our 4,000 goal, and it's a show I'm really proud of, and as always, I ask, if you are a patron um, and you're down to do it, please let people know in the chat uh, the benefits of being a patron. Um, also, May 18th, happy Haitian Flag Day. <laughs> we cover, um, obviously, as best we can, Latin America and the Caribbean on this show. And I want to recommend people read uh, Kim Ives in Haiti Liberté and go back into some of our coverage of Haiti and how our policies in Haiti and the history of Haiti, both as a inspiring, credible place and also uh, as a, absolutely a neo-colony is, um, you know, generating among many other things, a major public health crisis there with regards to uh, Corona. So here's what I'm gonna do uh, before we get to the super chat questions. I'm gonna do a little bit of a read from my book Against the Web, The Cosmopolitan Answer to the New Right. And I'm going to be doing a little bit of these uh, in general. And then I'm going to give you two book recommendations. I keep saying I'm going to give book recommendations on these streams, and I feel like I don't end up doing it. So this time I'm going to finally do it. This is from a section that I go into in the chapter on Sam Harris, um, where I write about, among other things, his you know, disastrous views of history, his lack of foreign policy, uh, chops, uh, and, uh, and things like that, but also the collision he had with uh, Ezra Klein and the, uh, the, the just ludicrous way that he related to the bell curve and the IQ debate. And so I'm gonna read a little bit from the book now. As always, if you haven't ordered it yet, go check it out, order it at Red Emma's or go to Indie Bound and buy it from your local independent bookstore. Uh, and it starts this way. In a 1996 Vanity Fair piece mocking Mensa, Hitchens notes, of course that's Christopher Hitchens, that the propensity for, jack, for crackpot reactionary and even outright fascist ideas keep, pop, keep quote, popping up like a jack-in-the-box and the turgid writings of the IQ obsessed, end quote. Even in the post-Iraq invasion years, when his liver and moral core were both failing, that sounds harsher as I read it out loud, Hitchens might well have had the sense to question the core premise that, quote-unquote, intelligence is measured by IQ, by IQ tests. And I'm really excited about this next, uh, uh, this next little bit because I've mentioned before, Stephen Jay Gould's Mismeasure of Man is an amazing book. And it's this incredible history of the kind of ascriptive hierarchies and 
quote unquote scientific, the, the intellectual architecture of racism um, that Adolf Reed actually ex explained so well in his anti-essentialism work. Stephen Jay Gould's brilliant 1981, The Mismeasure of Man, is essential reading on this point. Gould has a lot of fun with the history of attempts to quote, to quote unquote, scientifically validate hierarchy, like the 19th century quote unquote race scientist Samuel Morton, Morton, uh, Samuel Morton. Gould discovers the discrepancies between the skull measurements Morton produced in 1839 and 1849 and concludes that Morton was so desperate to believe in white superiority that he unconsciously manipulated his data. In 2011, Nicholas Wade published an article in the New York Times entitled, Scientists Measure the Accuracy of Racism Claim. And it goes on to talk about uh, Wade's work. Um, and uh, actually what turned out to be horrible reporting that a lot of people think discredited uh, Stephen Jay Gould, it did not. And I'm gonna pick up here from a qu uh, quotation from a great piece in Jacobin by Matthew Lau called Remeasuring Stephen Jay Gould. And this all fits into uh, the Harris uh, embarrassing himself with IQ stuff. More recent evidence suggests that the reanalysis of Morton's skulls made computational mistakes that favor Caucasians. And as several studies now show, the scientist ultimately did not challenge Gould's main claim that the inconsistency between Morton's measurements in 1839 and 1849 indicate unconscious racial bias. Moreover, the difference between uh, values for all races were cor corrected as Gould originally argued so small as to be significant, as to be statistically insignificant. And then I say, this is all worth remembering not because the Harrises and Murrays and Wades of the contemporary world believe that intelligence can be measured in the way that Morton thought it could, but because it's a instance of a historical trend. Attempts to quote unquote, scientifically justify racial hierarchy always end up in the historical dumpster of empirically refuted garbage science. So that's from Against the Web, and I'll be doing a couple more of these readings, including, I guess, on the concluding chapter where I outline cosmopolitan socialism, which is the part that I'm really the most excited about. This is the first book I want to recommend to you guys. It's called uh, A Legacy of Liberation, Tabo and Becky and the Future of the South African Dream. This book is really well written. And it gives you a window into a fascinating political personality. Thabo Mbeki was born into really the top echelons of the African National Congress. His father, Govan Mbeki, was a prominent communist ANC organizer and actually was one of the political prisoners in jail in Robben Island. Uh, along with Nelson Mandela and other luminaries of the struggle against apartheid. Thabo Mbeki was his son. Thabo Mbeki went into exile as a young man. He studied economics in the United Kingdom and he received guerrilla training in the Soviet Union. Uh, Mohammed, how did, you how did you like the book? Thank you so much. Um, he uh, received guerrilla training in the Soviet Union and he was a major figure and the ANC's external wing, which really was incredible pioneers in international solidarity and cultural diplomacy in the fight against apartheid. There's so much to learn from, uh, from the African National Congress historically. He then succeeded Nelson Mandela as president. He definitely uh, sort of moved from communist to, I guess, sort of Swedish social democrat to in some ways, certainly neoliberal, although he actually did significant investments in the Africa, South African social welfare state and was globally controversial because of his views on Zimbabwe and most significantly HIV AIDS. This book is careful, it's sympathetic and critical. Uh, Gerviser is a liberal, um, an important activist uh, actually now for the LGBTQ community and journalist in South Africa. We don't have the same politics, but this is a methodical and fascinating, uh, just incredibly good biography of Tabo and Becky, which also um, 
with some of the lessons from some of the sort of pivots in South African politics from the social democratic and revolutionary commitments on economic redistribution connected with liberation from apartheid of the uh, Freedom Charter to the neoliberalism of Thabo and Becky's African na uh, Renaissance have, have lessons uh, to teach us as well about socialism, capital, and, and identitarian politics in different contexts. So that's a really good book. This book, I'm reading this now. I have a very different political worldview, but this is important. Has China Won by Kishore Mahbubani. Kishore Mahbubani is uh, Singapore's former ambassador to the United Nations. He's at the Lee Kuan Yew School in Singapore. And this book, and it's important in general. I mean, this is, I, I learn a ton. I don't agree with everything, but obviously I love talking to, Pop, uh, to uh, Pepe Escobar because he's so creative and dynamic and brilliant and a, and a really, really insightful guy. We have strong disagreements on certain areas, but it's very important to understand what the kind of engine of the Chinese worldview is. What is the Chinese strategy? It's important to have an objective understanding uh, uh, really of any country on the planet, let alone the kind of premier rising superpower that there's gonna be increasing tensions with. So this talks about core strategic mistakes that China's made, core strategic mistakes the United States has made, and then uh, misperceptions in the relationship. And it also gives you a good, um, a good kind of window into uh, at least some of the kind of Singaporean diplomatic mindset, Singaporean foreign policy insight, which uh, definitely has migrated to the Chinese leadership. So those are the two book recommendations. That was a little a dose of Against the Web, Cosmopolitan Answer to the New Right. Buy a copy of it at Red Emma's. Um, guys, uh, if you have any other... Um, if you want to riff a little bit, if you got questions, you got comments, you want um, to get some impressions, now's the time. We can hang out a little bit, uh, but you got to uh, hit those super chats uh, to keep it going. Um, I think, you know, in general, I'll just say a little bit more about this kind of China dynamic that we have to navigate. On one hand, it's of premier importance that we fiercely resist the forces that want a new Cold War with China and the United States. We recognize the push from the military industrial complex, from the arms manufacturers. We recognize even the global market, the global market competition between US and Chinese weapons manufacturers. Um, and the very dangerous, very hawkish national security state interests behind pushing aggression with China. Uh, this is very, very important. Then there's understanding what the kind of Chinese strategy and worldview is as best we can. Obviously, it's extremely difficult uh, because of lack of resources, information, language barrier, and so on, and, and the huge ideological biases of, uh, 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 of most people who, who, who write about this. Uh, but we need to tease it out to some extent. Then third, we need to have a constructive conversation uh, that absolutely recognizes that, of course, uh, 90s and aughts globalization, as exemplified by the pushes of things like NAFTA, GATT, permanent normalized trade relations status with China, is a disaster for the United States in particular in terms of deindustrialization, in terms of undermining worker uh, solidarity, uh, and taking advantage of extraordinarily brutal conditions. Uh, in China, that's number three. We need to talk about that. Um, and then and four, I think, um, you know, again, figure out a way to synthesize it. Oh, the surveillance issues. We have to understand not only the human rights abuses in Xinjiang and Tibet, which are obviously significant, but how those models of surveillance systems, especially when we compare that to the stalker, uh, all-consuming platform capitalism of Silicon Valley, we certainly need a third way uh, between those two models. And that's actually what tomorrow night's commentary is going to be about uh, as well. Michael, you often say that the left needs to be both emotionally intelligent and Machiavellian in its day-to-day -day political organizing. Can you elaborate what that th that practically looks like? Um, well, again, I think it's, it's in those... Uh, let me just... I'll get right there. Is there a way to internationalize action against 
capital to reduce state violence against Chinese citizens fighting for a better future. I don't, I look, I think that we always have to um, try to speak as honestly and to the extent, um, you know, just simply reporting and giving voice to things like uh, some of the human rights abuses in places like Tibet and Xinjiang are important, uh, absolutely. And that's important in the same way that having a reflection on any human rights crisis anywhere across the globe is important. Now, it's very hard because human rights have been weaponized by U.S. imperialism. And usually uh, there isn't really a practical effort to go along with them. So right now, uh, I, I think we can do our best to be intellectually coherent and bring stories forward, but on a policy and practical level, no, not very much. Uh, and frankly, uh, the primary policy push needs to be against uh, this push for aggression with China where legitimate issues will be cynically utilized. And that's how liberals are, in are you know, enlisted in all of these catastrophic foreign policy pushes. I mean, look at things like Libya. And Libya is one of the worst things that has happened in foreign policy. Uh, and the, the human rights narrative was key to that. Samantha Power will be back under Biden. That's a disaster. Read Daniel Bessner's work on Samuel on uh, Samantha Power. Uh, so I think with Machiavellian and strategic, I guess it's some version of, I think that sometimes you see with the left, on one hand, this all consuming moralism and some very cult-like tendencies, which are totally off-putting to normal people. And again, just sort of internally mean and ineffective and moralistic. So there's this kind of, you know, obsession with tone policing and behavior policing and this and that. Uh, in a way that, again, doesn't build a healthy internal culture and it doesn't translate out well to a broader audience. And then on the other hand, and I think, you know, the easy example really is exemplified with Elizabeth Warren, where people had this profound naivete about just like the basic structure of a campaign, two campaigns running against each other, a competition for resources, a competition for media coverage and need to run a normal presidential campaign and differentiate. So I just think in some ways, you know, it's, it's an ethos and it's a dialectic that I want people to play with. What does some being really practical and ruthless and strategic look like? And then on the other hand, what is having an infinitely warmer, more compassionate, more human, more sophisticated attitude look like? And I think it's in those two steps that again, we can also avoid, you know, because another thing the left unfortunately does a lot is write checks that can't cash. Of course, we need to be able to hold politicians of all parties accountable. Of course, we need to be moving into a phase of serious labor strikes and figuring out how to harness social unrest. But we're not there yet. Um, so when we make threats like it, uh, it doesn't make us look credible. So what is the way, right? And again, I think this involves a whole bunch of issues from how to relate better internally to how we um, uh, build a movement and a capacity uh, that is much more appealing to a, broad, to, to a broad set of people. John, I hope that answers something. John, thank you so much. Outstanding independent journalism, I'm honest, uh, I'm honored. Uh, check out the history of the BLF, Green Bay, Green Bands, Aussie, Union action in the 70s, Jack Mundy, United Radical Laborers, suburban upper middle uh, middlers and smashed destructive uh, construction industry bosses. That sounds exactly like we need to learn for. Time for Biden DNC hypotheticals. Love you, Brooks. I don't even know what that means, but uh, I am absolutely a supporter of tactical and strategic voting. You vote for who will ever give you slightly better appointments on, on the NLRB. That's it, that's the Democrat. I, I fought really hard. I think even frankly, uh, you know, I know we alienated some people because I didn't uh, play games about how important Bernie was, um, but we lost. And so now we're in a situation where the dynamic is on one hand, you push back against the limited conversation about electoralism and then you, uh, to, to really expand the terrain of politics, 
primarily, in my view, with a focus on trade unionism. I'd really recommend, actually, everybody just watch this incredible stay at home on A. Philip Randolph. I mean, that is an American and international hero that people really, really should be grounding themselves in right now. Um, so opening the terrain of, of what is politically possible, how we can expand that terrain, and then on the other hand, um, again, of course, tactically vote. I mean, there's uh, immediate human suffering that is reduced with things like DACA. And I think if we look at our political moment, and this is very bleak, but I think it's the truth, as how do we hold back certain tendencies so they don't get completely locked in? Say just like a totally consolidated authoritarian platform capitalism, a complete extension of the commodification of all areas of bio life externally and even emotional life internally, which I think, again, the left has been totally ineffective at pushing back at, against, and sometimes in some ways even been a conduit for, that if we go into this phase where, where things get even more locked and even more restricted, that will make it much that much more difficult when maybe there's a capacity for another push um, in say another five, 10, 15 years. We have to try to keep those small cracks and doors opened while trying to enlarge the terrain for real political possibility on the future. And again, I think the core instrument of that has to be a serious internationalist labor movement. Um, do you feel the same about do you feel the same about Bernie since he dropped out, or has your opinion changed in any way, whether micro or substantial? No, very little. Um, my only my serious criticism of Bernie is that he missed that Patriot Act vote. I think you know that's a problem. Uh, that's an enormously dangerous vote. I'm going to talk about it more tomorrow. I have a problem with him not showing up. No, guys, Bernie Sanders. Look, no one is perfect. No one, you know, whatever. But no, Bernie Sanders is great. And Bernie Sanders' campaigns put more on the table. Um, there's there's many other things that social movements, and labor movements that are extremely important. But those campaigns cannot be overestimated. Uh, can you know they they were incredibly important. And I think a guy who soldiered in the wilderness, keeping hold of the flames like Medicare for all, when those things were absolutely on the margins, um, who has a certain decency about him, certainly more you know, relative, obviously, to any of the other uh, players um, that he was dealing with on the presidential stage. No, I, I, I like and admire Bernie Sanders. And I actually think that the reaction cycle to Bernie Sanders we have to avoid, too, because I think that that's kind of part of the, you know, that's, that's sort of like this consumer discarding tendency. Uh, you know, these were these were noble struggles. Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, they really tried. And with regards to his endorsement of Biden, I mean, first of all, I've said to you that I support tactical voting and I think it is very important Trump lose and I'm not gonna, you know, sort of pretend otherwise or, or, or come up with some big, you know, uh, convoluted thing about that. It's simple and straightforward stuff. And Bernie said that from the beginning. You know, while we were working our hearts out for him, Bernie said that this was hugely important and this was what he was gonna do. So, you know, he kept his word. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Um, I definitely have tactical differences with the campaign. I definitely wish they did some things differently. Um, and I said so at the time and I said so in post, um, but I also am gonna see him as the person who put Medicare for all at the center of the agenda, the only candidate for calling to free Lula, the person who the reason we're talking about, you know, a federal jobs guarantee to somebody who really saw himself as an ally of unions and someone who was, you know, clear from the beginning in his career with many, many core struggles across every category. So I just, I still have a lot of appreciation for Bernie Sanders and I don't think I, I think that kind of perfectionism and discarding uh, is not spiritual and not Machiavellian. Guys, I'm gonna do this less, but I do have to say as we're watching this, um, uh, 224 people are watching and only 56 likes. Let's get, a, let's get that up to at least 100 likes. Come on, people. Um, and definitely, if you're a patron, 
let folks know uh, in the chat about how great it is to be a patron. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, thank you so much. We just got one. Uh, Deontay Campbell, thank you a million. Um, yeah, any other uh, questions? Um, any other Super Chat questions? Hit, hit me up. Um, I hope the balance that I'm trying to strike with ch the China conversation uh, is resonating. Because obviously it's, you know, taking on Asia period it is extraordinarily complicated, just like any other place that we've tried to put attention on, Latin America, Africa, and so on. Um, but the other dimension with China is that it isn't in a, it's a, it is a rising power that is a different dynamic that opens up um, a different terrain of questioning. And at the same time, uh, we need uh, always first and foremost to push back uh, against the PERMA national security state. And that also needs to be disconnected or decoupled from some really important conversations about building anti-fragility, uh, having some localism with things like medical supplies, energy, agriculture systems. And you're gonna see a lot more interest in this. People are definitely gonna be more and more engaged um, in, uh, in, 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 local efforts like that. We need to move those in a constructive way. Not a one-to-one -one given, but what lessons might the U.S. learn from balkanization and the failure of Yugoslavia, if any? So the Balkans and Yugoslavia is a place that absolutely fascinates me, and I need to know and read a lot more about it uh, before commenting on it. I've heard some people uh, argue, like Robert Wright, who I have a lot of respect for, that in some ways, the social splits in America today are not as extreme as they were in the Vietnam era. And I think that's an interesting thing to note. I do think there's always the dynamic that when you have social media, um, there's going to be a, uh, you know, certain things are going to be accentuated. I also think that we need to, as much as possible, we cannot skip that there are real divisions and real profound problems uh, we have. And again, this is a clear distinction to draw. Those guys in Michigan with those guns, uh, that is actually fundamentally dangerous and authoritarian, any kind of potential power military relationship between them and the Republican Party. And I say that as, again, as somebody who also, on the other hand, a lot of the fascism and authoritarianism talk definitely gets extremely ahistorical, sloppy, and undisciplined. And I regret to the extent, particularly in 2016 and 2017, if I played any role in that. At the same time, we cannot deny, uh, you know, again, particularly in Michigan, that that is actually real. And that's an extremely dangerous dynamic. So my point to say, though, is that even as we cannot skip or deny the huge importance of these other uh, dynamics, I still think we need to be looking as much as possible uh, for unitary uh, material connections and material policies, hazard pay, health care, federal jobs guarantee, and also, and it's in the book, a healthy, dynamic, grounded cosmopolitanism so that there is a positive orientation that living in a truly diverse dynamic world, grounding oneself in a multiplicity of inspirations and resources is a better way to be. It's not just a moralistic exercise. It's not a haranguing exercise. It's not uh, this, this, this off-putting narrow culture. It is the best of the United States. It's the best of internationalism. It's the best of every tradition. And we have the capacity to do that. And that should be our advantage. I mean, because we are everything from, you know, the people who read in every dimension of political theory, philosophy, and art. And we're also the people who have the connection to, uh, you know, to, 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 to sport, to the last dance, to, the, to, to all of it. And that's advantageous. That, that cultural capacity mixed with a grounded materialism and a positive uh, process of addition, not subtraction, is a winning synthesis and formula. I am totally confident of. There is a patent filed for some incredible tech that came out of the Navy. 
fusion. I don't know what that means. Is that with regard to COVID? Uh, I don't know anything about that, but that's great. I mean, I was also reading in the Financial Times that a biotech company in Boston uh, was suggesting that they were looking at some positive indications uh, for a vaccine. And, and as Emma Viglin pointed out on Twitter very astutely, you know, what's a promising great thing to be excited about uh, versus, um, you know, a pharma company or a biotech company putting out a press release to try to juice its stock or get some venture capital because I'm sure obviously you know it's it's pharma it's you know there's going to be an enormous amount of bullshit and hucksterism involved in any kind of market activity um but you know it's something obviously uh of course that's incredibly important and then the other thing that's important about any conversation about vaccines and uh you know South Africa Cyril Ramaphosa uh, organized a letter in this that it needs to be international and freely available and that's both of course an ethical necessity it's also um going to be scientifically uh necessary you can't just you know i mean again it's the obscenity morally of just pushing it into peripheries which already have happened of course uh in terms of uh, you know class and global position internally and externally but the um the the uh that that in terms of it not coming back, basically, you need to take care of it everywhere. Um, any other super chat questions, comments, requests? Um, I really look forward to everybody becoming uh, patrons tomorrow. I'm really excited to have Nando and Big Waz on. We're doing a Woke Bros. Uh, we're talking about a lot of topics, we're talking about oligarchs and sports ownership following up on the uh, this embarrassing attempted coup in Venezuela, uh, catch up on some things in the unfortunately disastrously successful coup in Bolivia. Um, and we're doing a new post-game series, a new post-game reading series with Daniel Bessner. Jay Turner, happy patron here. Lots of good stuff on the TMBS Discord, but my favorite thing is always what we're reading now on Patreon. That's awesome. We offer a lot. Michael, hope you're well. Would love to hear your theory. Uh, would love to hear what theory you're reading right now to all watching who might yet have the book. Highly recommended. Thank you so much. I am still reading with, and I mentioned it before, uh, Peter Schlotterdijk's You Must Change Your Life. Brilliant. And I love it's getting away from these totally boring and ineffective conversations on religion and talking about... Um, practices and spiritual technologies and actualization as um, a sort of like inner verticality or an inner Olympics. I, I just think it's brilliant. Fave Patreon perk, audio episodes, listen at work, awesome. The Sunday episodes, the Sunday illicit histories. We're doing a bunch of illicit histories that we're playing right now. We do the think tanks with the whole team, but we're also doing a kind of series where we're talking about the things that have shaped where we're at from the financial crisis to the 2016 campaign, but we're starting with um, Pakistan today and the CIA, ISI, Saudi nexus in Afghanistan, how that's still playing out today. Hit like and share, thank you so much. So yeah, I mean, and of course the post games are a ton of fun. Uh, sipping leftover weed, coffee, milk, love you, Mike, love you back. Glad you're enjoying yourself. Appreciate all of you. I really, really hope that everybody is staying safe. I hope that people's family and friends are staying safe. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna be in full force, obviously, tomorrow. Um, if you're new, and also we're getting the store back up uh, in a couple of weeks. So in addition to hoodies and tees and stuff, we're also going to have pins and a whole bunch of other kind of fun TMBS stuff. Um, if you haven't watched it yet, definitely watch the conversation we just unlocked with Dustin Guastella on the American Labor Unions. Go check out The Jacobin on A. Philip Randolph. Watch me and Anna, of course, on weekends. Um, and if you can, definitely now's the time to jump. Go to patreon.com slash TMBS uh, and become a patron. Appreciate all of you guys so much. Stay strong. Stay healthy. Much love. Treat yourselves well. Treat each other well. Appreciate all of you. Thank you.